Uh, well, welcome to the uh, April presentation of the Historical Society. I'm, I'm David Temple, the president of it. Uh, I usually ask you to be here, but I'm sure there's no problem in this, in this, in this, in this uh, crowd. Uh, I think this, this will be a lot of fun. This is, this is a uh, program that uh, Gloria has given a couple of times to rave reviews uh, elsewhere. And uh, I've been looking forward to hearing it. And now, now my dream is coming true. <laughs> uh, I can't top that. A couple of short announcements before we uh, start this. One is we have an opening uh, a vacancy on the board for the Historical Society. If anyone is interested in uh, local history and wants to work with some good people for a few hours a month, uh, I'd like to talk to you after, after the meeting. Uh, the second thing, uh, you've seen that uh, jar there. Uh, uh, th these presentations are free and open to the public. If you don't have to put anything in it, if you gave the last time, that's fine. But the, 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 the catch, however, is the society does have to pay rent for this. We have, we have uh, all the other bills. We're trying to upgrade our services and uh, our uh, facility. And we have a, uh, if, if the heating system has collapsed, and we're OK through the summer. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, asked, I asked one of the congressmen. Forgetting, uh, completely forgetting that it snowed this morning. We have so many jobs. So so far, the low bid is, is about $12,000. And uh, it's, uh, I asked a human contractor who came in to look at the job. Uh, I said, I wondered if the uh, uh, furnace might have been installed during the Nixon administration. He said, no, more likely Eisenhower. <laughs> but uh, I, I've got that, that uh, jar there asking if, if uh, our work to preserve, promote, and share Medfield's uh, rich history is important to you. Uh, and you have not donated last month. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you put in five or ten dollars, whatever, whatever you do. You can't uh, sometime this evening. So thank you. Uh, right now, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, our guest speaker, Gloria Rice. Her title is the title. Her talk is the title. Major <laughs> <laughs> Fairyland. The beautiful and bizarre. The secrets <laughs> out. <laughs> Story, I think, when I, when I first heard about it. Uh, when I think of uh, Gloria, uh, I, it, it reminds me of the famous quote by John F. Kennedy, uh, who, upon receiving an honorary doctor from Yale, said, Now I have the best of both worlds. I have a Harvard education and a Yale degree. <laughs> well, it turns out, uh, Gloria has a bachelor's degree in archaeology from Yale and a master's and doctorate in the archaeology and anthropology from Harvard. Uh, she was collections manager of the uh, Harvard Peabody Museum for 15 years. 13 long years, 13 yep. Long years. Uh, <laughs> been executive director of the Needham History Center at Museum since 2002. She's going to be talking about William Emerson Baker, who in the 1870s developed an 800 acre uh, fantasy land, sometimes considered the first amusement park in, uh, in the country. And this was on the Dover Sherman line. This was uh, shortly before West Needham split off from the town to become Wellesley. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's give a warm welcome to Gloria. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here tonight. And thank you to David for those, those very kind words. Um, let me introduce you to William Emerson Baker. Um, he is not the man looking at the camera, and he is not the woman who's checking her email in the front there. <laughs> we're, we're not sure. We think it might be a pickle. We're not sure. Uh, uh, he's the man who's sitting back with the walrus mustache, who's sort of enjoying all the commotion, and that's a lot what he was like. The great author E.B. White once observed, I wake up every morning determined to both change the world and have one hell of a good time. Sometimes this makes planning the day a little difficult. I always thought that this was an excellent description of William Emerson Baker, whose Ridge Hill Farms, better known as the Baker Estate, is widely described as the first amusement park. It was, in fact, much more than that. A working farm, a science museum, a botanical garden, a laboratory for Baker's social and political ideas and ideals. 
but for all its serious purpose, and there is no question that Baker and everyone else also expected to have one hell of a good time. William Emerson Baker was born in Roxbury in 1828. He was one of the seven sons of a not too successful businessman. Baker attended Roxbury High School and he hoped to go to college, but there was not enough money. So he went out to work at the age of 16. He was apprenticed to a wool jobbing firm and was paid $50 in his first year. This was generally considered adequate. Apprentices received room and board along with their training. Nevertheless, in his second year, Baker suggested that he be paid on commission, a percentage of all the new business he could bring in. That year, he earned nearly $1,000. He saved enough of his earnings in the next couple of years to start investing. He was a mechanical tinkerer by nature, and the machine that caught his fancy was the newly invented sewing machine. Baker made his fortune in sewing machines. In 1849, when he was 21 years old, he took his investment stake and formed a partnership with a Boston tailor named William Grover. Grover could see the great usefulness that sewing machines were going to have in his line of work, but the machines were not yet practical. The lower thread had to be wound off a bobbin, but because, but, but because bobbins were small, the thread was too short to allow for efficient industrial production. Anybody's ever used a sewing machine, right? The bobbin is always running out. Same problem, but you're doing it at home, you just fill it. You're trying to do it on an industrial scale. It really is, is very inefficient, it doesn't work. So together, Grover and Baker developed a mechanism to feed the lower thread off a large spool, like the top thread, so the machine could continue sewing for long periods of time. They formed the Grover and Baker Sewing Machine Company with an office on Tremont Street in Boston. As their success grew, they established offices in Manhattan, in Brooklyn, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Cincinnati, Chicago, and Milwaukee. Of course, there were others in the sewing machine business. You've probably heard of Isaac Singer and Elias Howe. In 1850, sewing machines were still new, and the patents were still being developed. So in 1855, the main players, and this would be Elias Howe, the inventor, Singer, Grover and Baker, and a company called Wheeler and Wilson, went to court in New York and formed a 20-year trust. That was legal in those days. <laughs> Not anymore. Not since Teddy Roosevelt, but in those days that was perfectly legal. Members of the trust agreed to pool their patents and limit the number of licenses they granted to other manufacturers. So instead of fighting each other, they locked in a royalty for each and every sewing machine sold in the US and Europe. This was savvy timing on their part. Uh, this was the beginning of the industrialized economy, the shift from handwork and piecework to mass production. This is, uh, in fact, a uh, Wheeler and Wilson manufacturing floor. As he showed in his wool jobbing days, Baker was not a man to wait for the customer to come to him. In 1854, he went to Europe, selling machines to the military and other governments to use, uh, and other governments of Russia, the Netherlands, England, and Germany. Two years later, he was in France negotiating with the Emperor Napoleon III. Baker records in his diary that the Empress Eugenie tearfully begged her husband not to buy the sewing machines and deprive the seamstresses of Paris of their livelihood. She was so insistent that the Emperor locked her in her bedroom so that the men could finish their negotiations in peace. <laughs> Back in the US, the new armies of the Union and Confederacy also needed machines to sew uniforms, and the trust got a royalty on every single one. And these machines were not cheap. The largest machine sold for $150, which is several thousand in today's terms, and even their least expensive was $80. In their first year, they sold 500 sewing machines. In their best year, they sold 77,403. Overall, they sold more than 500,000 sewing machines. In 1860, Baker married Charlotte Farnsworth of Roxbury. The young couple enjoyed a months long honeymoon trip to Europe. Charlotte seeing the sights and Baker visiting potential clients. When they returned to Boston, they bought a house in the South End, moving uptown a few years later to the new neighborhood of Com Ave. They had two sons named Walter and Eddie. Baker began to spend his now considerable fortune. Although he never had the opportunity to go to college, he was by no means an uneducated man. He had a wide range of interests in the sciences, in health, and in public policy. He was a mechanic of considerable skill. 
He was also a writer and political satirist. He funded programs that fostered the knowledge of science and fine arts among the broader public. Baker obtained a grant from the city for the land between Boylston and Newbury Streets, enabling the Society for Natural History, now a retail establishment but the original Museum of Science, and the new Institute of Technology to build their first buildings. They would later move to Cambridge as the Museum of Science at MIT. He was a patron of the Museum of Fine Arts and the first Boston Aquarium, where he exper experimented with fish farming. He was a supporter of the Institute of Cookery and Fanny Farmer's Boston Cooking School, institutions dedicated to nutritional science and sanitary cookery, what we would later come to know as Home Ec. <laughs> to our sorrow. In 1868, at the age of 40, Baker decided to retire from business. He had plenty of money, and the trust was about to expire and would open up the patents to new competition. So the two partners sold their stakes and retired in wealth. Now a man of leisure, Baker started to buy up land in Needham for a summer residence. He chose an area in the south of town where Charles River Street intersects with Grove Street, overall about 770 acres, <laughs> imagine that, uh, which he called Ridge Hill Farms. Baker intended to live here for about half the year, April to October. He was genial and sociable and he loved to give parties at any excuse would do his wedding anniversaries, the death of a pet, the birth of a calf, the laying of a cornerstone. Charlotte, unfortunately, did not share the sense of humor. She did not care for the Needham property and rarely, and visited it rarely, preferring to stay in the Boston townhouse. Charlotte may have regarded the Ridge Hill Farms as a pointless indulgence, but for Baker, it was the place where he could indulge all of the interests to which his curious and energetic mind led him. Baker hired a Welsh landscape architect named Richard Greaves to help design the estate and manage the staff. In the 10 years that followed, Baker and Greaves filled the summer estate with over 100 amusements, attractions, and exhibits. These included a museum of industry, two bear pits for his pets, an underground crystal grotto featuring the 40 thieves, a pleasure lake, saloons and restaurants, and a 225 room luxury hotel. Baker did not intend the Ridge Hill Farms to become a public attraction, but uh, it was intended for the amusement of himself and his personal guests, but as the fame of the estate grew, people could not be kept off. So he eventually opened it to the public as his fairyland of the beautiful and bizarre. If you look at a map of the Baker estate, you see that it breaks up into roughly three sections. Um, it's called the Grove, the Slope and Mount Charity. This is uh, Charles River Street. This is Central Avenue that heads through Dover Center and into Medfield. Um, branches off Charles River Street heading into um, South Natick that way. And Grove Street that heads into Wellesley. Uh, right in those days, it was all Needham. Wellesley and Needham were all, this, were all one town. After 1881, the Wellesley line runs just about this way. Um, much to his horror. Uh, but basically, it's sort of like three, three sections divided along, divided along the roads. Thematically, they correspond roughly to uh, science, pleasure, and health. The eastern portion of the estate was dominated by Baker's formal gardens and by the six-story Norino Tower. The tower was said to be named after a Greek word meaning knowledge. Each of its six stories was dedicated to a branch of science, mechanics, optics, medicine, architecture, sight and sound, and on the very top floor, death, the end of life. What is it? What is the aim? What is the record? All unanswerable questions. At the very top of the tower was an observation deck with an unparalleled view of the surroundings. Attached to the tower on one side were the Arcadium for children, which is this piece, and the black and gold stable. Uh, both of which provided amusements and displays for interest, of an interesting and edifying nature. They were also the main refuge for, uh, for entertainment if the weather turned foul. Kids could also keep busy at the Arcadium while the adults went elsewhere. Attached to the other side was the black and gold stable painted in these startling colors to eradicate the resemblance of the Norino Tower to a church. After build, building it, he realized everybody thought it was a church, um, which he didn't like. 
The stable was filled with interesting vehicles and mechanical devices. There was an automatic conveyor that fed the horses every hour, although the precise timing was not so crucial since the horses were fake. <laughs> Baker's own residence was in this section, surrounded by a landscape of formal European gardens. Uh, that's, that's his house. You can see the Norino Tower in the background. And he had a series of gardens and fountains laid out. They're really quite, quite beautiful. He would acquire statues. Um, this is actually quite a famous one, the dying Indian. Um, and he and Greaves would find these things and then plunked them around, you know, landscaped them into his, his various gardens. And this is, uh, yeah, that's a view from the top of the Norino Tower. So you can see uh, this is Grove Street, this is Charles River Street. We'll come back to this eventually, that's the hotel. His house is sort of over there. At the back of the gardens was the Union Chapel for the use of Baker's guests who might be religiously inclined. It was strictly non-denominational, consecrated by Baker himself to his creed, liberty of conscience, faith, hope, and charity. There's a flock of stuffed doves suspended from the ceiling which moved softly in the breezes. The Union Chapel was so called because it was dedicated to the peaceful reunion of the states after the Civil War. Behind the chapel was the Alba Bowling Alley and the Pavilion Hall. Those were among the few buildings that Baker reserved for the use of himself and his guests and were not open to the public. The public was welcome for, to a drink of water from the Leaky Boot Fountain or for Minnehaha's Laughing Water Wigwam, which was a temperance exhibit. Unfortunately, the floor at the exit was mounted on springs, so the sober and virtuous would find themselves staggering and stumbling in a most drunken manner as they left. <laughs> The grove and the gardens was also the home of many of Baker's zoo exhibits, including monkeys, colorful birds, and numerous small animals. Baker's two boys spent much of their summer on the estate, and they had a souvenir stand and a market garden in the grove, given an entirely futile attempt to teach them the habits of thrift and industry. <laughs> um, this would not, in the end, work out, but you can see Walter and Eddie there thinking of ways to dun the public. So where did Baker and Greve get all this stuff? Some of, the, some of it they built themselves, but they were shameless scavengers. If there was a fire or a demolition in Boston, they were there. They bought statues, columns, architectural details for their stockpile. A major source was the Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition of 1876, which brought exhibitors from all over the country and the world. Of course, once it was over, there was a lot of material to get rid of, so Baker bought it. The Chilean Pavilion, the Leaky Boot, the Peruvian Pavilion, the Crino Arch, the Garden Arcades, the statues, and of course the Hotel Wellesley, which we'll talk about in just a bit. All of that was material that he bought in Philadelphia and had shipped up and rebuilt on his estate. The dominating feature of the western portion of Baker's estate was of course Sabrina Lake. Now Sabrina Lake is still there. Um, it's now all private property, so you can only sort of see it from Grove Street through you know, people's driveways and heaven forfend you actually try and walk, <laughs> walk there. Um, the lake was entirely man-made, dug out from a marshy hollow. It was bordered by the lakeside balustrade, which is decorated with classical figures and busts of American presidents. Along the eastern edge was the Arboretum Basin and Spray Fountain, created out of copper pipes and statues recovered when the old Boston Theater was demolished. Farther out on the lake was the white and gold boathouse, sheltering the canoes and rowboats. It was decorated with allegorical and humorous panels painted, from, painted, painted panels from the former St. George Cafe on Tremont Street. So that's the, the whole scene again. You can see the spray fountain in the, uh, in the uh, boathouse and the balustrade running and along. Charles River is where? Charles River is here. Uh, this is parallel. To Grove Street. Grove Street would be about here. So this is parallel to Grove Street. Charles River Street would run this way, and the Charles River would be that way. So is Sabrina Lake still that large? Yes, it is. Yeah, it is. And it's all about two feet deep, but it's, <laughs> but it's quite wide. Um, there were several small islands in the lake that could be approached either by boat or by bridge. Swan Island, 
Oak Island and Tripond Island, so-called because it was connected by three bridges, the lovely Arboretum and Rustic Bridges and the monumental Coliseum Bridge. The Coliseum Bridge was constructed of timbers from the Peace Coliseum building of the Boston Peace Jubilee held in 1869 to 72 to celebrate the renewal of North-South friendship at the end of the Civil War. Between the lake and the road were the broad lawns of the Sunset Slope. The Union Monument Building marked the site of Baker's Cannon Party for Union and Confederate soldiers. In January of 1876, Baker was in Charleston, South Carolina, where he met a number of the officers and men of the Washington Light Infantry. After his return to Boston, the regiment sent him a cannon. That summer, Baker invest, invited the regiment to a party at his estate in Needham, where he had installed the gun overlooking Sabrina Lake, saying, you who stood behind it will meet those who stood in front of it and shake hands over it. Several hundred people gathered at Baker's estate that June, including the light infantry and their ladies, members of the Mass National Guard, the governor of Massachusetts, the mayor of Boston, and numerous other dignitaries for a raucous party that lasted more than a week. <laughs> oh, well, this was typical. He had one that was 2,500 people. This was a small one in comparison. <laughs> Toward the end, the Southerners gathered noisemakers, drums, pots, and pans, and serenaded the ladies with their terrible music. Coming to the rescue, the Northerners ambushed them with pillows obtained from the ladies' quarters. The Southern ladies armed their own men in similar fashion in a battle between the blue and gray pillow brigades carried on for over 30 minutes until innumerable down pillows were destroyed and everyone was laughing too hard to stand. After the party, Baker erected the Union Monument building on the site of that fight, celebrating the return of at least one small measure of peace between the North and the South. The Chilean Pavilion was the former Chilean mineral resources exhibit at the Philadelphia World's Fair. Um, there it is in Philadelphia. Uh, for a while, it was used as a garden pavilion. You could see it in that big, that big uh, picture seen from the top of the Noreno Tower. You could just see it in the corner. Um, and then later, it was moved across the street um, to be part of the pump house for the, Boston, for the uh, estate's water supply. If you're familiar with Forbes Pond, which is that little pond on the other side of um, Charles River Street, the one that always looks like it's about to overflow into the road. Um, that's, that was his uh, wellhead. That's also still there. Um, to the north of the, of the pavilion was the Boston Fire Monument, made from granite columns salvaged from the old Boston Post Office after the Great Fire of 1872, tied together with an iron arch and surmounted by a small statue of Mercury, messenger to the gods. So you can see Mercury is up there. And these were the Boston Fire, the, the old post, was then the old post office, now the old post office, then the new post office, um, was literally where the, where the fire stopped. And um, a couple of the columns, uh, you can't see them from this angle, but a couple of the columns were fire damaged, so they took them all down and started again. He bought them and turned them into this. The slope was also where Baker housed his pet bears in the circular bear pit and the octagonal bear pit. And finally, beyond the bears was the Creno Valley of Fancies, Follies, and Frivolities. Here was found a large cement bottle shaped structure from which numerous empty wine bottles were suspended as a souvenir of the cannon party and dedicated to the departed spirits. So but you get some idea of how much, how much they drank in that week. <laughs> yeah, this was, this was very, bad puns were, were his life. <laughs> Near the bottle were other displays. This other one is Darwin's Hut, a commentary on the theory of evolution. A gentleman made out of old bourbon barrels, known as the old, one of the old Kentucky bourbons. A sour-faced portrayal of the Boston governing classes with whom he had a constant ongoing feud, um, known as the representative of the hub. Leaving the Creno Valley, a small bridge crossed over a stream, and unfortunately the bridge would often subside, leaving the crosser with wet feet. That little bridge led out to the grave of Billy Bruin, one of Baker's pet bears. In July of 1874, Baker took delivery of a two and a half year old black Labrador bear, which he called Billy Bruin. Billy weighed over 500 pounds and stood some eight feet tall. Baker owned Billy for approximately three hours, which is how long it took for Billy to escape. So you can see Billy was smarter than the average bear. Billy spent his first night in Dedham under the porch of the Congregational Church they wandered back to Needham, where he spent some time in the High Rock Woods. He was next spotted in Quincy several days later and got as far as Weymouth, 
before he was finally shot and killed while trying to swim the river. His body washed up in Hull and was returned to Baker, who had the skin stuffed and put on display. <laughs> never, never waste what and what nots. Um, the rest of Billy was buried in a solid copper coffin and buried overlooking the lake. Baker invited more than a thousand guests to Billy's funeral. This is the uh, <coughs> funeral procession. Um, regrets had to be had to be expressed in the form of poetry. And then the book was printed up and given to, given to guests. Um, so this is, this is the, the, the front of Billy's procession with children in animal masks and being led by Father Time, the great destroyer. Near the Creno Valley entrance to the Gothic freestone arch, salvaged from the Presbyterian Church on Beach Street. The arch was the gateway to the mysterious Smuggler's Grove, excuse, Smuggler's Cove and grottos. The grottos were underground, cab uh, underground caverns where the smugglers' captives were held for ransom or punishment. Here could also be seen Mrs. Cardiff, if any of familiar with the famous uh, upstate New York fraud, the Cardiff Giant, which was a, supposed to be an antediluvian man, it was a figure made out of chalk. Um, well, this is Mrs. Cardiff. Those are the 40 thieves suffering a gruesome and somewhat eccentric punishment for their crimes. The grottos could only be seen by the dim light that filtered through the stained glass roof of the crystal tower above. Unwary visitors emerging from the dim tunnels into the bright daylight often took a wrong turn, only to find themselves face to face with the bears in the circular bear pit. They were relieved to find, however, as their eyes adjusted, that there were strong bars between them and the bears, but no doubt they hurried back out the correct way. South of the Charles River was Baker's farm. This area was known as the Charity Reservation. It was less of an area for tourists and more of a home for Baker's other experiments. One way that we know that tourists did not go here is the unfortunate lack of pictures. He actually had a photo studio on site and they made stereo slides which they sold as souvenirs, which is why we have so many nice pictures of the estate. There are very few pictures of the Charity Reservation. So obviously it was not considered an area for, for tourism so much as an area for some of his other interests and work. The farm was where Baker did his livestock experiments, which makes him sound kind of like a mad scientist, but maybe it seemed that way to many of his public at the time. Public health was the cause dearest to Baker's heart. This was a time when most of the sources of food were highly compromised. Tuberculosis was endemic in cattle, and pigs were little walking bundles of parasites. This is a famous engraving of Five Points in uh, Lower, New York, um, Lower Manhattan. Um, and you can see, pigs were essentially an urban livestock. They just foraged, foraged the streets and ate whatever they could find. And that you really don't want to think about that. You really don't want to think about that. This is why your mother told you never to eat raw pork. Um, these diseases entered the general population through the food stream, causing widespread human illness. Baker believed correctly um, that the filthy conditions under which these animals were raised was the source of human infection. He espoused the then radical notion that many of the causes of disease and debility could be eliminated quite simply by, by a more sanitary approach to food production and preparation. So most of the facilities in the reservation were, dev were devoted to improving public hygiene. Baker argued that most food animals were naturally clean and that if treated properly would remain healthy. His beloved pigs resided in the famous sanitary piggery that's an invitation to the sanitary piggery cornerstone laying party, um, which I think he invited about 2,500 people to. In the sanitary piggery, the pigs were kept in strictly clean conditions and given wholesome food. It was even rumored that the porkers were provided with little beds and little silk sheets. An unlikely accommodation, but certainly in keeping with Baker's sense of humor. Baker believed that the usual method of pig keeping, penned in filthy sties, are allowed to roam free and eat trash bred diseased animals and tainted meat. He said, the flesh of those swine fed on city garbage is liable to be unfit for market, as this garbage is often fermented and sour. And thus the city of Boston, by the disposition of its garbage, directly aids in filling our hospital wards with patients diseased from eating unwholesome pork. The laying of the cornerstone for the piggery was the occasion for another of Baker's spectacular parties. And as I said, this was an invitation. The invitation is about this big. Um, it's like a full, you know, uh, tabloid size, four-page four page newspaper. 
Uh, some 2,500 people attended the festivities, including the governor of Massachusetts, the mayor of Boston, the vice president of the United States, who was Henry Wilson from Natick, uh, Union generals Sherman and Burnside, the Washington Light Infantry from Charleston, the 5th Maryland Regiment from Baltimore, and the Massachusetts 5th Regiment. The reservation was also where Baker had his two, his two hotels. Um, I mentioned before the spectacular Hotel Wellesley. The Hotel Wellesley was a reconstruction of the, reconstruction of the American restaurant from the Philadelphia Exposition, though apparently somewhat enlarged. It was the very last word in luxury accommodation. It had 160 guest rooms, 12 toilets, five baths. And the best rooms cost $4 a night, and they were said to be worth every penny. Cooks trained at Baker's Institute of Cookery provided the food for his hotel and prepared, under the, and prepared it under the scientific principles of sanitary food preparation. Some of the proceeds for Baker's hotel and restaurant went to support the Trephophagian Institute, a name that Baker claimed came from the Greek word to nourish. The Trephophagian Institute was a charity organization whose purpose was to distribute the delicacies of sanitary cooking to the urban poor. This is a time when there's a huge amount of immigration. There's a lot of what we think now of as sort of the public library movement, the public education movement, public health. These were all sort of ways to alleviate poverty. They were seen as a way of uplifting the poor and also um, assimilating the immigrants. So sort of like my, my home ec teacher used to call Fanny Farmer, and this, with great reverence in her voice, the mother of level measurements. Uh, <laughs> foreigners, you know, cooked without using, without measuring stuff. They threw in a little of this, they threw in a little of that. Every time it came out different, um, that's, you know, that wasn't the way they should cook. They should cook, everything should be, you know, repeatable every single time. Everything should be in a recipe. Everything should be um, even. So, so there was a lot of this, this sort of public health and public education was going on at this time. And this was part of, this was part of that. Public health became over time Baker's main passion and the main focus of his energies. In 1881, Baker petitioned the Massachusetts legislature to allow him to secede his land from Needham and establish an independent hygienic village to be called Hygeria. In Hygeria, residents would practice the most scientific and modern methods of sanitation and hygiene and food and dwelling. It's one of the, it's one of the uh, three issues of the Hygiene Reporter. The lessons earned would be offered to the state to benefit others. He therefore also requested tax-exempt status on the grounds that his discoveries would benefit all the citizens of Massachusetts and save the Commonwealth far more than was lost in taxes, um, which is now the essential justification between a 501c3. The beneficial example of Hygeria would induce the people of this Commonwealth to practice such sanitary economies and household reforms as shall tend to diminish crime and disease and improve the vigor of the race. The Needham Selectman opposed Baker's petition. <clears throat> Needham was unwilling to lose Baker's estate, which amounted to nearly 6% of the town's taxable acreage. And frankly, they were probably not so impressed with Baker himself, whose flamboyant style was at odds with the more serious and provincial character of the town. And apart from the necessities of real estate, easements, taxes, etc., Baker had had little involvement with town officials and almost none in town affairs. So using their influence with the legislature, the selectmen kept the petition languishing in legislative limbo for four years. From the Public Health Committee to the Committee for Mercantile Affairs to the Public Health Committee to the Committee of Mercantile Affairs to the Public Health Committee and back and forth and back and forth until it was finally refused. Furious, Baker accused them of strangling the child of my heart and threatened to leave suicidal Needham and establish Hygeria in another state a threat he had not enough time to carry out before his early death from a heart attack in 1888. And that was just the highlights. As I said, there were more than 100 uh, buildings and attractions on that estate. After Baker's death, his wife Charlotte sold off the Ridge Hill Farms. She had no use for the land, and certainly not for the attractions. One purchaser, George Alden, tried to keep parts of the estate in operation, including the Hotel Wellesley and several of the attractions. But this was ultimately not successful. The Ridge Hill Farms was a creation of Baker's restless imagination as much as his money, and really could not survive him. Another problem was that most of the structures were never really built to last. The Philadelphia Exposition, the Boston Peace Jubilee, these were short-term events. 
And the constructions were never meant to stand the test of time. Fires and lack of funds soon doomed the effort. That's the Hotel Wellesley burned down in 1892. Um, it was too far on the fringes of town for the fire brigade to reach it on time. So the land was sold off for residential house lots. And thanks to Sabrina Lake, it's now some of the most desirable property in Needham and Wellesley. Um, a few pictures taken in the years following give an idea of the sad breakdown of the estate. That was the Boston Fire Monument. And that's the Boston Fire Monument in 1935 and since had toppled, toppled further. The Coliseum Bridge. The Gothic Arch. That much, pretty much this, this piece is still standing, though that photo is quite old. This is an amazing photo. There's Sabrina Lake in the balustrade. It all starts to grow over and fill in. So now this is, this is how Sabrina Lake looks now. It's been cleared of, cleared of structures, though you can still see some foundation stones and surrounded by homes. Bits and pieces of the buildings and foundations are still visible in people's yards. That's now what's left of the Boston Fire Monument. Um, and in the background there is the bottom half of the Crystal Tower. But over time, nearly all traces have been eradicated of Baker's magnificent fairyland of the beautiful and bizarre. I will leave you with two quotes from Baker's obituaries. The first is more critical and the writer more conventional. He said, Baker was a man with an immense amount of imagination and money, with uh, immense amount of imagination, money with which to indulge it, and not enough education to keep him from being wildly eccentric. But his apparent madness was interspersed with any amount of method, and some of his eccentricities were object lessons. And so under all of his queerness, it may be traced, there may be traced a substratum of shrewdness and practical sense, which had it been curbed and reined in by the prevailing methods of the world, might have put him on record as one of the foremost men of the century. But the second writer is more generous and maybe more understanding. He said, William Emerson Baker was a gentleman who had accumulated a large fortune by the exercise of the qualities which compel success in everyday affairs. And yet part of his life was lived amid surroundings as grotesque and in occupations as little reasonable as those which obtain on the world on the other side of the looking glass. He spent a great deal of money and a great deal of ingenious effort in the adornment of his well Wellesley estate and in the countless inventions of a fantastic and extravagant imagination without parallel, so far as we are aware, among the solid citizens of the Republic. It was a gentleman's country place, a dime museum, a junk shop, and a perpetual April Fool's Day combined. Thousands of people visited Mr. Baker's establishment in order to inspect the achievements of a spirit of fooling allowed to run riot. Respectable visitors were always welcomed, and the more amazement they manifested, at Mr. Baker's masterpieces, the better pleased was the gentle-hearted creator and proprietor of this little world turned topsy-turvy. He might have spent his money worse. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Did he die broke? Yes, he did. He did. He, did. Um, he had a fortune when he retired, that was probably the equivalent of the tens of billions. Um, and over the next 20 years, between the traveling and the building and the acquiring, he managed to spend most of it. Um, <laughs> he had a mortgage with his father-in-law of $100,000 when he died, which Charlotte was not happy to find out about. <laughs> Charlotte did not know this. And, and probably part of the reason she sold it off so fast after he died was because A, she couldn't care less, and B, she needed the money. Um, there's actually, uh, Walter and Eddie, well, Eddie um, grows to adulthood, has children, and, and in fact has living descendants that live um, out on the Cape in Mashpee. But um, Walter dies quite young at a house party, he's 23, I think, at a house party in New Jersey um, from ingesting chloral hydrate. And um, the, the, it, it was never solved, like whether it was an accident or whether it was deliberate, but one of the things that he comments is he didn't, Walter didn't have enough for anybody to, you know, to be, to be trying to uh, 
get anything from him. So um, I think, yeah, that really by the time he passed away, most of the money had been spent. Um, Charlotte pretty much had the townhouse on Com Ave and little else. Yeah? Two questions. When he opened it to the public, was there a fee? There was. Um, yeah, he actually tried to not open it to the public and um, wasn't able to keep people off, so he, start, he charged a fee of 10 cents, figuring, well, then people would think twice, but they didn't. So then he wanted people to come on Tuesdays. He charged 10 cents on Tuesdays and 25 cents every other day, figuring, well, then people will go on Tuesdays because it's cheaper. And that didn't work either, and he just got a lot of flack. You know, a man as rich as you, charging the working man a hard-earned quarter. So he finally just basically set regular hours, charged an entrance fee, and, and left it open. But and was the hotel successful? The hotel was quite successful, yeah, for, for quite a while. Um, he had a train spur, actually, uh, built out to bring people from Boston. If you're familiar with, um, Needham used to have a train station in Charles River Village on Charles River Street. You can still see, if you're coming over the bridge um, from Central Avenue from Needham to Dover, if you look to your left, there's a scary looking trestle. Um, but that was the train line. And he actually convinced the rail company to build a narrow gauge spur that went from the Charles River Station along the river to his estate. And um, that's how he brought in guests, day, day visitors. Um, that was their, the usual method of, of transportation. So it was fairly successful for, for a while. Yeah. But he, he was basically appealing to his economic group. Um, no, but, but actually I should say successful in the sense that people came. He was never recouping the costs. I mean, the, the entrance fee didn't pay the upkeep. And that's why his own money started diminishing. Um, his parties were, yeah, they were for, they were for his, his economic class. But the um, regular day visitors, for the most part, were a little bit of everybody. It was, it was considered a fairly nice day out, so people would just bring the kids, that kind of thing. It's, it's actually kind of interesting about where he fit in class-wise, because he's born poor. He's self-educated. Charlotte is actually a higher social class, but she's not you know, up at the top. But through this period, he is hobnobbing very much with the Brahmin class. But then he gets into this fight with the legislature over Nigeria, and he ends up alienating a lot of people. And a lot of people, of course, he's alienating are that, that legislative class, so the wealthy, the established. Um, and uh, at the, his, the, his funeral notices actually mentioned that it was quite sparsely attended. So for all those people, and, and why you would say that in somebody's obituary notice, I don't know. But <laughs> um, so all those people that he, that, he, that he socialized with in the course of his life sort of fell away by the end of his life. Um, but I think there is always that, you know, that sort of Aravist thing about, you know, aspiring to, you think you fit in, but they really know you don't. So yeah. his wife sold off the property? She sold it all, yeah. She sold it off. She actually pretty much cut it up into the same chunks that, that he, um, you know, that I think that's sort of the, the thematic chunks. One, uh, the Aldens bought, um, the east side of the river, the Pope's bought the west side of the river, and uh, a family called the Scots bought the side between uh, Charles River Street and the, um, the river, and in fact still own it. A large, a big chunk of it still belongs to them, their, grand, their grandson now. But, but the other parts have been sold off now into, into house lots, but, but yeah, it was all sold off right away. She, I, she probably kept the downtown house, but she may not even <coughs> kept that. Yeah. Anything else? If you drive around that area, do you see any signs of it other than the, the ruins that you show? Uh, to even see those, you have to creep onto people's private property, which is not, not that easy. Um, so <laughs> Sabrina Farms, let me pull up the map. Hang on a sec. Uh, Sabrina Farms Road, which is a little street off Grove, sort of guards, <laughs> guards the entrance now. To a large extent, come up. Going to come up. Yeah, there we go. 
um, you know, this is, you know, this dies when I need it most. All right, well, this is all private property now. The house is still standing, his house. Uh, I'm sorry, there, his house. And there's now a house here. And it's kind of interesting because when you see it, as you're driving up Grove Street, it's got a fence, but the fence ends about there. So as you're driving, you can see into the fence, they have this big, huge, dead flat yard. And that yard is the old Italian garden, you know, with the fountains and the statues. It was all, it was all leveled. And now they still have this big, flat, <laughs> flat yard. Um, and the hotel is down in the... Hotel building. is here. That, yeah. Here. Oh, and um, this road is pretty much... The hotel is there. This road is now pretty much a driveway to um, the house that the Scots ultimately built that looks over the river. And um, as you drive up the driveway, you can actually see foundations. And, um, you know, those, those sort of arched underground window wells. Not, there seems to be, actually, there seems to be some basement still um, existing under there. Um, the carriage house, which is, definitely this is not, this is dying. Carriage house, which is there. Um, you can still see the foundations. The piggery, which is here, you can still see the foundations. But it's pretty much that. There's one or two um, things along the road. There was a gateway entrance that he had, and you could still see the two pillars for the gateway. But, but no, most of it has been, has been cleared out you know, as, as the, the places were rebuilt. Is that map online or accessible? Um, you know, it's probably on my website because I have a short article about Baker, but um, otherwise, no. It, it actually was part of the uh, print. There was in 1972, um, Leslie Crumb Baker, who was then the historian for the Needham Historical <coughs> Society, wrote a book about Baker, and um, this map accompanied it. So we have a lot of copies of it, but it's not. Uh, I've scanned it, obviously, because I. I can't orient myself over there. Now it's done. My batteries are dying. This is Charles River Street. So Central Avenue going from Needham Center to Dover Center down here and then on to Medfield. Um. <laughs> okay, let's see. Needham Center is here. Oops, let it catch. Um, and Central Avenue, which runs then into Dover Center, becomes, uh, runs into North Street and into Central Medfield. Um, there's a light, and this is Charles River Street, just before you get into Dover. This is Charles River Street, and that's, that's Grove Street. The river's down here. His house is on Grove Street. Uh, <coughs> Try not to trip on these various wires. Um, it's not on the corner of anything. It's it's right there. But there's this is now a a little drive called Sabrina Farms Road. Yeah. That's uh, gated. It's got a guard. It's got a 24-hour guard that doesn't let you ever go by. Has the Needham Historical Society gotten all this material? No, no. There wasn't that much to. I mean, a lot of it was just dispersed. He didn't. Um, we have. <laughs> I don't. I don't actually. We got the photos um, from the Alden family. They said the Aldens. Aldens bought up one of the chunks and tried to keep it going for a while. Um, they apparently ended up with at least a good collection of photos because we got those. We have the hand and foot from the Mercury statue. <laughs> what happened? At, what happened to the uh, Boston Fire Monument? is after it was sort of allowed to, at the estate was allowed to deteriorate and grow over, a little tree took root, sort of growing up basically through the middle of it. And it was fine until the hurricane of 38, which caused this tree to just, you know, flash, slap around, and then it just, that's how the, the, um, the columns got all tumbled and knocked down in the course of that knockdown, the mercury statue was shattered into pieces. So we have, actually I think a hand and a half, a hand, a hand minus fingers and a foot. Um, but most of the stuff we have is from the Aldens. They had the photographs, they had a couple of um, the documentary resources like the um, sanitary piggery 
invitation, a copy of the hygiene reporter, um, other things we pulled from the newspapers. So were like, the people whose houses were built on that land or there of, of this or what it was before? Probably the earliest ones were, but these days you'd be surprised how few people living there now know. They're really, a lot of them are very surprised to find out that they, you know, oh, this is where I live. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> The hotel was right here. Okay. So um, if you're familiar with this area, yeah. going toward Dover on Charles River Street, um, going toward Dover on Charles River Street, Grove Street goes up this way. If you turn your left, there's a driveway, it's a causeway basically, that leads up to um, the house that's now right about here. Um, and basically in front is a big hay field. And that's where the hotel was, which is kind of amazing. <laughs> 1891. So that lake is still there? So the lake is still there. Isn't that where the neighborhood, the, um, so it's not near the river, the gate, you know, the neighborhood is right? Yeah, yeah, gated, the, 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 the gated road is right about here, running from uh, Grove Street into into what was then one of the islands, what was, what was then Tripont Island. Um, but yeah, Sabrina Lake is still there. Uh, what he called the artificial fish pond is now called Forbes Pond, um, is still there. All overgrown with lily pads in the summer. If they, and, and it was used for? It's a spring, actually. Um, it, was it was the water supply. <coughs> it's a natural spring. For, for, the for the whole state. estate, and that's yeah. why that, that um, there was a picture I showed of the Chilean pavilion had a pump house, right, right. a windmill next to it, and that was the... Um, I noticed that um, one of the men you mentioned was Carter. Would that have been the Carters that did, yeah, the whole thing? That is an interesting dynamic. Uh, William Carter, founder of the Carter um, Company, the folks that made pajamas with feet and union suits and currently no longer a private company, but the largest um, manufactured children's clothing in the world, um, came to Needham as a young and very impoverished man from England, set up his own, his loom in his, li in his living room, his poor wife, his loom in his living room, and his dining room was where they sewed things up, and his <laughs> bedroom was where they packed things up, and I don't know what room she had for herself, but. Um, turned it into a hugely successful business and in his later years um, served in a number of town offices, among them selectmen. And what's interesting, about you have two self-made men in the textile industry, roughly the same age, completely different personalities. Carter is sober in, you know, every sense of the word. He's you know, he's got, his house is no bigger than anybody else's house. He's the richest man in town, but there's no, there's no mansion. There's nothing there to show that, you know, it's any bigger than anybody else's. He runs his business. His sons work in his business. He goes to work every day, pays all his debts. There's no, there's no drama. <laughs> there's no, you know, uh, he, you know, he funds the church. Um, Baker's completely different. Completely, you know, he's, he's flamboyant. He's, He's colorful, he's you know, in and out of Boston. And his, his network is mostly Boston, so he's really not focused on Needham at all. Um, Carter's whole network is pretty much within Needham, except for getting his sons into Harvard and into the legislature. He's boosting sort of the next generation, um, but he himself is fairly, is, is fairly conservative and, and self-effacing. And so um, they're at odds about a lot of things. But it really comes to a head with this, um, with this Nigeria thing, where all of a sudden he wants to drop out of 6% of the town's <laughs> taxable acreage um, at a time when Wellesley had just separated. That was the other thing. Wellesley had just separated, taking half of Needham's territory, but 60% of its tax base. It was definitely the wealthier end of town. So in 1881, Wellesley separates a couple in 1884. Carter asks to secede into his own, into his own village, and Needham is just not, not, not willing slash able to lose that kind of revenue. But also, 
not willing to do a guy any favors who's never done anything for the town. You know, he wasn't a big employer. He didn't, you know, shovel money into town. You know, Carter paid for a couple of the churches. He paid for the library. He paid for the other. There, you know, there are a lot of endowments from, from Carter in town. Um, Baker did none of that. He really spent very little time in, in Needham at all. He was just on that fringe of town. And <clears throat> so they really saw no particular reason to do this for him, especially when it was going to cost them so much money. Mm -hmm. yeah. So did they have conflict actually? <coughs> yeah, yeah, they had, they were, okay. they were at Dodds for, yeah. Yeah, and this letter actually, this suicidal Needham letter goes, you know, you just saw, he just saw the, the header for it. It goes on. And it goes on in really violent terms, you know. Um, strangling the child of my heart is probably one of the milder ones. <laughs> you know, there's the sawtooth knife. Of, you know, like, oh, please. You know, but yeah, so they're, 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 not, they're not getting along. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It was my pleasure. And, uh, your, I love doing uh, this. It's a lot of fun. In the back. Uh, there was one other Can question. Oh, yeah, he sure. He didn't have very many pictures taken of him, apparently. No, no, it's amazing. So, you know, very few. You would think um, maybe he was. No, yeah, you, you would think that he'd be like front and center of like every, you know, here's the boss at Fire Monument with me in front of it. No, and in fact, um, that last one, which is a sketch. Yeah, it's um, not. Some, I got this in the mail anonymously. Somebody said, well, I got these. <laughs> said, I, I got these um, tickets for something called Ridge Hill Farms. And you know, I said, it's in Needham. And do you think you're interested? And what they were is day passes in, you know, for your quarter or 10 cents or whatever it was to get in. And on the back of it, um, there were two of them. And on the back of one of them, my picture go again. Baker had um, tallied up the, uh, the receipts for the day, which was like, you know, $325 or something like that. <laughs> and or $300, I say $3.25. Or something. Um, but on the back of the other one, I'm not sure why this is not coming up right now. The back of the other one was that little sketch. And I'm not sure who did it, <laughs> whether he did it himself. Lost the video, and I'm not sure why, because it's showing you the desktop, but not the, uh, the picture. But uh, yeah, so that just sort of literally came. But one or two, one or two other. Basically, you saw all the ones I had. <laughs> yeah, it's not the, oh, 1881. 1880. Oh, why? Oh, because <sighs> Wellesley and Needham and the, North, the East Parish, Needham, and the West Parish, Wellesley, had been fighting since 1720 <laughs> over the um, location, originally over the location of the church. But as Wellesley became more affluent, um, their, basically their interests started to diverge. And in 18, by 1881, they were ready for what was going to be the 17th vote on separation between the two parishes um, between 1720 and 1881. And what they did actually was realizing that town meeting would never vote for this because East Needham outnumbered them. Um, they packed the meeting. They just basically showed up several hours early, took all the seats. The moderator was one of the people trying to engineer the split. So he had to recuse himself, but appointed a, another you know, a, a, a temporary moderator so he could be in the, on the floor arguing and voting. Um, they fill all the seats. So by the time everybody else shows up for town meeting, seats are all full. So they're out in the hallway, they're out in the portico, and time comes for the vote. And somebody says, you know, Mr. Moderator, there are a lot of people that you know, want to vote that can't enter the room. And he looks around and says, I don't see anybody. <laughs> And so that's how they vote, wow. town meeting votes to separate. But, but it was, at that point, basically economic and social. They literally said, we were tired of being dragged down by the working, at, the working class end of town. <laughs> we, we have yet to forget.
forgive them. Just was, <laughs> that, was that? Which, which parish was that? Oh, well, originally it was the Needham First Parish, the Needham Only Parish. Um, which this map is 1856, so uh, Sabrina Lake does not appear <laughs> on it yet, but um, it would be right around here. Yeah, uh, the first parish, which is was at that point at Nahoyden Street and Central Avenue. But beyond North Hill, the, the, there were fewer roads, and it was harder to travel. So, um, but by 1881, I don't think anybody was going to church anyway. Um, but it was really an issue of um, class and attitude. 